So anyway, this book covers almost the same model that he uses in here for an imperative programming language, but describes the semantics in uh, denotational style. The thing that he does that I mentioned last time, I think, is that he um, kind of pulls together in each as each new um, capability is added to the language. We extend the syntax by adding more and more power, um, powerful constructs. The first thing he always does is says, what's, what's the type? What are the type? How do you tell if what you've written down is well typed? Um, so anyway, before we really can do much of anything, even if we go back and dip into the Schmidt book a little bit, I, you know, my problem with it is, I don't know, I, I can never tell if I'm repeating myself, is that, oh God, it was published in, um, I think 1998, <laughs> even worse, 1994. I think most of you may not have been born in 94. And I feel like using a book, even though the material is, this is classic material, I can't bring myself to use a book that's older than the students. So um, we're using Huddle, although there's other options. We may try and look at a few other things if I can find, get access to them. Okay, so, but no matter what we do, uh, we have to have, and for some of that, you, you know, this is probably a uh, boring lecture because you're really good at discrete math and the material that we cover in discrete math. But um, if you need a refresher, I mean, you really need to know the stuff and, and Huddle goes over it and I didn't assign a reading from him yet, but he goes over it, I think, up to page, tw between pages uh, 16 and 24. He kind of covers the, what he calls the mathematical preliminaries. Now, the one thing that I kind of don't like about the book is, is that it is his, his mathematical style is a little bit more informal than I like. So, you know, you can look at my slides and see they're saying the same thing, but maybe in a more precise way. So let me share my, um, my slides with you for today's class, which is essentially a review of um, the discrete math material that you need to know for this. Now, some of this, of course, we also did in 3015. Um, so I just wrote these up this morning. Uh, it's not, I, this, you know, what I don't have yet, and if anyone knows how I can do this, I'm, I'm running Ubuntu and Linux, and I bought a Wacom tablet. There's even in the setup, they're like, set up your Wacom tablet. But Wacom doesn't pr provide drivers, so you got to download these drivers from elsewhere. But I, so I can get it to sort of work, but I can't actually get the tablet to work. So right now, I'm still working on it. I have no way of sort of writing interactively during class. When I try the, um, let's see, let me stop sharing. And let me just try it one more time. Let me just see if I try the whiteboard on Zoom, I think I'm so brain damaged with this. Um, I can barely write, so let's see. Um, see, <laughs> the aspect ratio is wrong. It's like making it much wider. I can't, this is, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I can practice more and get better at it. It seems to be a problem. I can type into my Emacs um, window to 
to try to give more interactive things. So anyway, I put these slides together. What I don't have is a lot of examples, but maybe as we talk through them, um, we can um, So maybe as we <clears throat> talk through the slides, I can bring up Emacs if I need to, to, to write some examples. So we're going to talk about the logical notation, sets, relations, and functions. Um, and I probably should have included section five on mathematical induction, but we can, we can talk about that as it comes up because actually, what we end up doing is not kind of the strain, the the standard kind of mathematical induction or even the structural induction like we did. It's kind of related to the structural induction we did in 3015 on functional programming on the lists. So if you're familiar with that, the induction that we're going to be using to prove things about these, the semantics is very similar to that. So for logical notation, now one thing I want to mention though is that it's really pretty interesting that all, a lot of the, we're going to start with logical, talking about logical notation. Most of the issues that have, that, that arise in describing programming languages already arise in describing logic once you have quantifiers like for all and exist. <clears throat> and this idea that is a fundamental idea in computer science really was uh, developed by log logicians in like the, the 1930s, Gödel and uh, Tarski and uh, Kleene and uh, uh, let's see, I don't know. Uh, quite a lot, von Neumann. Um, so this idea of separating, having a separation between syntax and semantics and keeping those two things kind of separate is like one of the most fundamental ideas in computer science because what do we get as input? We get a stream of characters. So, you know, e either you're reading those bytes off a disk or you're receiving them over some channel. And, you know, you have to make sense of that stream of characters. And so to make sense of it, we usually build some kind of structure within, with using data structures in the programming language. And then we can easily traverse that structure and we can do certain kinds of easy queries. But when you write out, for example, if you write out to the disk, your database, for anyone who's taken databases, I mean, you know that the data structures that are used to represent databases are, you know, pretty sophisticated, you know, built for fast, for fast access. But when they're out on disk, they're just a bunch of bits. And, you know, so uh, this idea of taking some kind of unstructured information and, and, and building and seeing if, it's, uh, if it fits into some particular kind of syntax and then applying the meaning to the syntax as a separate step is, one of the, is sort of very much what we're doing and very much what was done by the logicians in the 1930s. So, um, you remember Boolean values, which is often in mathematical notation denoted by this um, kind of double B, includes values for true and false. You know, I actually can't recall if he uses T and F or true and false. I didn't go exactly from the book. Now, we are going to assume that there's an unbounded set of propositional variables. And what that means is, is that we can always find one more variable. Um, so, you know, we're going to write down proposition. So what is a prop by, by writing a proposition? What is a proposition? Well, really here, maybe I should have written 
instead of saying it's a logical formula, the atomic propositions are symbols that stand for something that in principle can be true or false. So that's what a proposition is. Something that can in principle be true or false. Um, that leads to, you know, amazingly complex and deep philosophical discussions and um, like what is a proposition? But if you just accept for, for us, we are going to have our propositional variables are going to denote things like uh, x equals y plus z or the size of something is greater than three. There'll be things that we can actually compute. We don't have to um, tr try to <clears throat> make sense of things like, you know, my love for this course is greater than the ocean. Like, mm, I have no idea what it would mean to say that's true or false. So that's something that in principle probably can't be made you know, in to be stand as a true proposition or as a proposition at all. One thing to remember is that some propositions can be false. Um, not all, you know, they don't have to be all true. They can be false. Like sometimes, you know, uh, I might write down like one equals zero and I say, is that a proposition? And you might say, no, that's not a proposition. It's false. But guess what? It's still a proposition, it just happens to be false. One does not equal zero, it's true. But the expression of saying does, is writing down the kind of a declaration, one equals zero is itself a proposition. It just happens to be false. So don't reject propositions that you sort of can eyeball and instantly know the meaning of and declare them um, to not be propositions. Now, this is the thing that came up in um, the 30s, is this business of what is a free variable. And I'm kind of a number that you can multiply by two to get that number. So you could write down even x, and that is the formula that exist a y such that 2y is equal to x. And so that formula even, it, which is exists a y such that 2y equals x, has x as a free variable. It's not bound by the exists. I, I guess I'm just gonna have to do it small because I don't think I can do this without, I apologize. I am gonna sort this out, I promise. Ah, oh, fine file. I don't know, whatever. So if I want to write like even, I could say, okay, in a, in a formula, as a mathematical formula, I'd say, well, there exists a Y such that uh, two times Y is equal to X. And so if you look at this, exists a y such that two times y is equal to x, x is not bound by any quantifier, whereas y is bound by this existential quantifier. And so that's the idea that we mean when we say um, a formula containing a free variable. That formula exists a y such that two times y is equal x has one free variable because there is no variable, the y, uh, x is not bound by any quantifier. So you can think of that as a Boolean valued function. You could say even x is true if when I plug in a number for x, the formula is true. So if I say, even two, I get back true. If I get right even three, I get back four. So this is a way to write down formulas that um, are, can take a free variable. But if you leave it alone, right? If I just say, um, 
Oh, come on back, you little, there you go. If I just say, write down this formula, exists of y such that two times y is equal to x. If I just write down that formula, that alone is not true or false. Because if I say to you, tell me if this formula is true or false, you're gonna say, well, you have to tell me what x is. So x is free, x in here is free. It could be anything. And until I tell you what x is, by actually plugging in a value for x, you don't know whether it's, whether it's true or false. Now, you can also generalize this by writing properties of, you know, k airy propositions, where, you know, you can have k arguments with free variables up, oh, there should be a little bracket on the end of that, x1 through x sub k. So, you know, we can try to, we, you know, I mean, because we're doing mathematics and, and, and computation, which are extremely precise things, we don't have to worry about things like my heart is as big as the ocean or whatever. You know, we don't, um, we can just assume that we know what so, uh, something that looks like we we can assume we can identify propositions. So if P is a proposition that has no free variables, I can write down not P. And mathematically, it gets this symbol, this, I don't know, what is it, like a turnstile? No, I don't know, not. <laughs> um, if you want to write down conjunction, you write P and Q. If you want to write down uh, a disjunction or an or, you write down P or Q with this upward slanting V. P and Q has this downward slanting or upside down V between them. Um, this one's called, in LaTeX, this symbol is called wedge. And in LaTeX, this symbol is called V. LaTeX, does anyone know what LaTeX is? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Go ahead. Yeah, so most people do. But, okay, so it's the system that I use to write these notes, for example. It's extremely good at typesetting mathematics. It was developed by um, Donald Knuth. Um, Knuth is one of the most famous computer scientists in the world. He started out as a young man saying, okay, I'm going to write down everything that's known about computer science. It's going to be seven volumes long. Well, so far he has three and maybe he's come out with a fourth on parsing, but, um, Knuth is kind of the source for everything. So after we published volume one, and volume three, he was ready to publish volume two. And the publisher, Addison Wetzley said, well, we're sorry, the typesetter who typeset your other two books died. And no one in the world can typeset math like he could. So it's not gonna look the same. It's not, it's not gonna be nearly the same quality of typesetting. And Canoe said, oh, wait a minute. And he went and he wrote tech. And, you know, this is always kind of an amazing thing. So people need a tool like Kernighan and Ritchie trying to write the first version of Linux. And they say, oh, we need a new programming language. First, we'll invent C and then we'll write Linux. <laughs> so anyway, Canoe said, OK, I need to publish a book. First, I'll write a typesetting system. And so he wrote this system. But it's very difficult. It's almost impossible to use straight tech. And Leslie Lamport, another Turing Award winning famous computer scientist, made a macro package called the tech. And um, <clears throat> that's what I use. And what almost every research computer scientist in the world uses, and many, many, many mathematicians. Like they don't use Word or other WYSIWYG style editors. They use LaTeX. 
which you can use pretty, you can get kind of an easier introduction to it by using something called Overleaf, uh, which is online and free up to a certain size of files. Okay, so we have not and or P implies Q. Now, in the book, he uses this notation, which is, you know, this um, kind of backwards subset. It's called subset in LaTeX. But, you know, this is more common is the uh, this arrow. But the problem is, is that for him and in this book with uh, structural operational semantics, he likes to use this arrow for a semantic relation. So he uses this for logical relations. And this is kind of, it's standard in older books. Um, in fact, I think that notation may have been developed by um, Bertrand Russell when he wrote a giant three volume set. <laughs> These are thick books. I have them in my office. Principia Mathematica, where he tried to develop all of mathematics strictly based on logic. And he used this kind of horseshoe symbol for implies. So it's not without precedent, but you know, probably this is it's been more something like this that you've seen. Um okay, for all, for all x p of x. So what this this X here means is, is that if there's a free X, it's, ca it's bound by the X under the quantifier for all. And if we have a whole bunch of variables, we can write down um, X1, you know, or whatever, X, Y, Z, W dot P of X, Y, Z, W. Okay? Questions? No question. I mean, you know, you should have seen this before, but I it's also. One. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I was just wondering about the, if there's a difference between uh, propositions and predicates? Right, I think propositions really are the atomic thing, and maybe we should be calling these other things predicates. The propositions are like the atomic things that you can't decompose into other by breaking apart logical connectives. And so like, you know, X equals one. That's a proposition. It's not equals is not a logical symbol. Equals is a relation defined over, well, let's say natural numbers or integers or something. So we're going to get to that in a bit, but yeah. So that's a good, that's a good distinction that I might, I probably could have made is to think of these as propositions and these as predicates, which are functions, mapping elements, and you know, one thing we do is we say, okay, what is X range over here? And that's typically called the domain of discourse. We're going to come down here in a second and talk about the other version. So exists now um, exists means that p you can ch <clears throat> choose some values. So when is when is a for all? Let's just take the simple case without many. With, not this one, but just so let's look at this one. Well, when is this one true? It's true if you could like run this. Let's say X is ranges over integers. And maybe P of X is something like, uh, there exists a Y which is greater than X. And that's true for every integer. Pick any integer in there. Now, we will, we'd be able to prove that mathematically by looking at the de definition of uh, greater than, but, uh, but you'd have to, like, if you were thinking of it computationally, like, how would you compute this thing? It would be like, you'd have to show an infinite number of things, right? You'd have to show, no matter which X I plug in to P, it's true. So the kind of standard way that you prove this is, okay, 
prove X and assume it's an integer, and that's all you assume about it is that it's an integer. And now prove P of X is true for an arbitrary integer. The other option is for something like the natural numbers or tree structures where you have a kind of um, uh, a natural notion of like a least element, um, you can develop an, uh, uh, an induction principle and then maybe you can, you can prove the induction principle using, you know, not using the induction principle. And then you have another way of proving for alls. So if the all for alls are natural numbers, sometimes you can just prove it by choosing a um, natural number. And I forgot to write down, like nat is the set zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Um, and if you, so if you choose an arbitrary natural number, sometimes you can prove P of X. Like suppose P was, x is equal to zero or x is greater than zero. Well, that's gonna be true for every natural number that you choose. But you only have to prove one for one arbitrary one. Now in exist, what you have to do is you have to find an x which makes the formula true. So, um, computationally, you might think of it like, oh, try zero, oh, not true, try one, oh, not two, try th two, try three, try four, try five. Oh, it's true for seven. But what if it's never true? Then the existential statement is false, but we can't really use that idea of sort of searching a, like an infinite search because if it's never true, we'll never get to the end of the search. So how do you prove an exists? Well, you actually have to find one. This is why proving things can be hard is because you have to be clever enough to think of, to be able to construct in your mind the thing that when you plug it in for X and P here makes the formula true. Now, a lot of times, I don't know, is there, are there any questions? The thing that makes this P of X formula true that would justify the formula that there exists an X such a P of X is called the witness. So if you can find a witness, if you can find some element that witnesses the truth of P, um, that's what logician, the language logicians use to describe what, what that is. So now a lot of times we want to restrict X. Like if I say for all X, X is equal to zero or there exists a, uh, well, let's see, um, or I don't know, let's see, um, I guess I'm trying to think of an example where the property is true for the, um, is true for integers, for example, or natural numbers, but it's not true um, for the real numbers or the rational numbers. And I guess you'd have to say, I don't know, he has an example in here. I can't think of one off the top of my head really quick. Can anyone think of one? Ah. Here's one. Uh, on page 18, he says, um, for every X, there exists a Y such that Y plus Y is equal to X. So that's false for integers, right? Because if I pick X to be one, I can't find, what, what, I can't find an integer that when I add it to itself, I get back one. But if we're talking about the rational numbers, that property is true. I can always take, okay, choose an arbitrary X, and then for Y, choose X over two. 
And then you get x over 2 plus x over 2 is equal to x, and that's true. So there's an example of a formula that is false. Um, for the integers, but is true for the real numbers. So sometimes your formula really depends on the set of things you're selecting. So you can write it down this way. You could say, okay, if I want to do a for all and I want to constrain the things that I consider for to plug into P, I can say, okay, for every X, X is in A. So A is some set. Oh, the integers. That implies P of X. But if I then say, okay, X, so that's true if A is the integers, but if, uh, I'm sorry, if, and for the formula that I just gave before, that's false for the inner, if A is selected to be the integers, but it's true if A is selected to be the, uh, the real numbers or the rational numbers. So as an abbreviation for this, instead of writing down this, you know, this part, normally we can just write for every X, which has type A or comes from the set A, P of X is true. And similarly, we can write, there exists an X of type A such that P of X is true. Now, it's interesting that with for all, we use implies. Like if you wanted to write that down without using this extra, this is just syntactic sugar, we say, for this. So what's syntactic sugar? It's just, a, I just have introduced a new little bit of notation that stands for something more complicated, but that you write all the time. So this is, this is not, you. it's not necessary to have this notation because instead in the standard notation, I could just write this once we introduce the notation of for sets and membership and sets. But it is interesting that um, if you want to combine together things where you're talking about an existential X, then you use con uh, conjunction, use and. And if you want to have preconditions on something for P here, type preconditions, you'd have to, you have to write them out um, as implications. That's because ordinarily this thing is not typed. It means you could substitute in any mathematical thing you wanted. You could bust. Could it be true of, you know, and typically you're not going to be able, I mean, you're not going to be able to write a proposition that actually depends on X that isn't somehow linked by its type correctness. It has to be linked to X. Like, you know, if we we're talking about lists and, you know, it said some simple property of lists, um, I say, um, append um, reverse, we say, okay, for all X, which is a list of things of type A. And so out here, we really have something like, uh, you know, for all A, which is a type, and for all X, which is a list of things of type A. Oh, I don't know. I, I was thinking of like, um, this is one I always kind of like, is that the reverse of, Oh, and this is X and Y here of X appended to Y is equal to, can you see this or is this invisible to some of you? <laughs> Looks good to me. Yeah, I can see that. 
I can see it as well. Good. Thank you for letting me know. I mean, it'd be a shame. Like, if no one could see this, it would be a waste of our time. I will figure out a better solution. So, for example, here's a little theorem we could write about about um, about lists that we proved, I think, in class or last time in 3015. You may have proved this. And um, so this is a property of, uh, or a predicate over two lists, X and Y, but it doesn't make sense to plug in an integer here, like for X and Y. They have to be lists for plus, plus, and reverse to be defined, right? So if reverse is a function that flops all the elements, reverses the elements in a list, and plus plus is append, so, oops. Now that's an interesting thing. In Haskell, they reserve single colon for cons. And so in, in class, you know, in, in functional, usually I like write this with a double colon. But here we're gonna not do that because he just writes a single colon to mean that this thing has a particular type. So reverse has the type, you know, like a list to a list and plus plus has the type um, a list arrow, a list arrow, a list. And remember these parentheses go like this. So that's a higher order function. So the point is, is that oftentimes your the truth of your quantified formula really depends on that you're plugging in the right kinds of things. This is called the domain of discourse for this. Um Okay, so those are logical formulas. I don't know, I could have written down maybe one other thing here. I could say like, you know, I could I could write the generalized version of this. I could say like, you know, um, for all x one comma dot dot dot, ah, come on, dot 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 comma x sub k, Now, what do we want to do here? We're making this up, right? I could say for all x1 of type A, for all xk of type A sub k, dot P of x1, comma, dot, 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 comma x sub k is really the formula for all x1 of type a1 dot for all x dot 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 for all x sub k of type a sub k dot p sub x one comma dot 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 comma x sub k. And you could do the exist one the same. So you could make a notation that allows you to write down a whole bunch of things. Okay? Does that make it easier to see if it's highlighted? Okay. All right, set membership. Uh, membership is a primitive notation in set theory. It's like there is no definition. You have to just kind of like understand it. And then when you look, if you're looking at real set theory, um, like the axioms of set theory, then you kind of get to understand membership also from the meanings of how it behaves with everything else. But X 
an element of A means that X is in the set A or X contains A. And it's true if X actually is in A, but what does it mean? I mean, these sets are these, you know, platonic, I, it's some kind of platonic idea of a thing that's out in the world, out there somewhere in the universe, but we don't, what is the actual set A? We don't really, we can't grab it, but we can kind of conceive it. And we read the symbol epsilon with a slash through it, uh, which disappears when I highlight it. Interesting. Oh, there it is. Um, as not in. And so there should be space here between these two things. One is X is not in A is the same as, it's just defined to be not X in A. So this is the logical not, and this is just um, a relation that's either true or false. So the following are all true. A is in, now sometimes we write down sets, small finite sets by writing down the squiggly brackets and putting the elements actually in there. A is in the set A comma one comma two. Um, one is not in the set containing the single element A. One is in the set containing one, two, and A, and two is not in the set containing A, A, A. Now, one thing to remember is that sets are like, um, in some way, the most abstract collection class because the only thing matters is if something's in there or not. There's no order to the elements. Like, you know, A12 is the same as 1A2 is the same as 21A. Like, it doesn't matter the order you write down things. And this thing here is just equal, this set over here, the AAA is just equal to the set containing 1A because once it's in there, it's in there and that's all that matters. I mean, sets are very strange really when you, if you dive into it because um, mathematicians, you know, or, or, and set theorists anyway, they, they want to be able to sort of describe all of mathematics using sets, but they don't use types. So sets are untyped. And so we come up, we start to look at something that looks a little bit odd. We say, oh, but there's also one of the axioms is, is that there exists a set that for every X, X is not in that set. That's the empty set, the set that contains nothing. And then it's pretty easy to prove that that set, is, the empty set is unique. And so, you know, we write it either like this with the, you know, a, uh, like a zero with a slash through it, or we write it like this with the brackets being empty. These two things mean the same, identically the same thing. So here's a point that always confuses students, and I'm sure that some of you have forgotten this, and maybe it doesn't matter for this course. We may, may never run into the, well, I don't know, we might run into something like this. Um, but the empty set is not an element of the empty set. And so I can write that another way. I could say the empty set is not an element of the empty set. I mean, and I could write it all four ways, right? I could write, you know, I could, flip these two around to different, but whatever the case, that, just think this is just the empty set is equal to, these are that mean exactly the same thing. So it's never, it's not the case that the empty set is in the empty set. The property of the empty set is, is that there's nothing in it. So how could the empty set be in the empty set? One way I like to think about it, but I mean, it doesn't always make complete sense, is I sort of think of sets as like a kind of a sack. And if I have a sack that's empty, I say, yeah, that's the empty sack. Now, I could do something like this, and I could say, oh, first, take the empty, an empty sack, whoops, the little one inside, so now I have an empty sack, and now put that inside of an empty sack. Now that, what was an empty sack is no longer empty. It has a sack in it. 
than one that doesn't have anything in it. And now if I take those two and put them in something larger, now I have three sacks, one containing another, which contains another. Now here's where this kind of analog breaks down though, because sacks have multiplicity. Like if I put two pennies in a sack, I got two pennies. These sacks have this kind of sets, sets as sacks are magic because <laughs> if I put an empty sack into a set and then I put another empty sack in it, it just, the, the second one, let's say, just disappears or the first one disappears. It doesn't matter which one disappears, but this is just the same as saying the empty set is an element of if I drew squiggly, you know, if I leave this one out, imagine the thing in orange is not there. The empty set is an element of the set containing the empty set, because that's like saying, is the empty sack an element inside of the sack which contains an empty sack? I don't know if that helped anyone or if it just makes things worse. Anybody want to say, yeah, that's horrible. Sorry, I have a quick question. Could you just like re-explain the, the last, the last one? This one? Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. That one. That one, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, there's been, in I have books. <laughs> There's been entire books written on saying that this is absurd because look, you're looking for this and there it is. It's in there. So it must be in there. Why are you saying it's not in there? Well, it's not in there because you're only allowed in this sack metaphor, you're only allowed to reach into the outer sack. You can't open up internal sacks to look in there. And so, oh God, what do they call it? Oh, it's got this really complicated name. Like it's the theory of parts as opposed to set theory. It's myriological theory, it's called, where you say, no, no, look, this is, and, and, and a, a lot of very respectable logicians and, you know, I wouldn't say a lot, but quite, you know, a number of very respectable logicians and, um, um, some mathematicians have tried, you know, have made, been able to make sense of a theory of parts. They say, look, this really is insane. Why, you know, a, a child can look at this and say, you're saying that this is not in here, but I see it right there. The problem is, is that you can't see inside of that sack to know that it's there. All you could see is that this sack is not empty. Okay. I don't know. Does that help? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, another question. If you replaced, I guess, the empty set there with just a one, uh -huh. would, that, would that still also not be true? If this one was a one and this yeah, one was a empty. one, replace both of them yeah. by ones? Yes, it's still not true. Okay, thanks. I mean, right, well, thank you. it's still not an element. So this, whoops, so this, this formula is still true if I replace empty, uh, both those empties by ones, this formula is still true. One is not in the set that contains the set containing a one. Now, the crazy thing is, I don't know, let's see. Uh, we have a little time, I guess. is that you know you can you can describe numbers in this way uh, one way is to say okay zero is the empty set and then you can say one is equal to the empty set containing zero the set containing zero now two is going to be equal to this is how this is one way that um numbers can be defined now, a nice property for numbers is, is that you could say two is equal to, oh, it's the set containing zero and the set containing one. And so then three would be equal to the set containing zero, one, and whoop, one and two. Now expand those out 
and you see that at the bottom, it's just a nightmare. I mean, it's all, And so you can see, here's one representation. The nice thing that this representation has about it is that um, all the smaller numbers are elements of three. So two is an element of three, one is it, so forth. Yes. Simon, is your hand up? No. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, so that's one way to, you know, and so you can, mo everything is a set. And so the only set that you actually have a handle on to start with is the empty set. Okay. Now, here's how we write down things. We write down X such that, the set of X such that, you read the vertical bar as a such that, P of X holds. And we're gonna use it, this comprehension, oh, in Huddle, he calls this this construct way of constructing sets as um, abstraction. But the standard term is that it's set comprehension. That's why in Haskell and all these languages now that have copied the Haskell list comprehensions, they're called list comprehensions because you're defining lists using this kind of notation. The intersection of two lists is just the list of things act such that X is in both in A and in B. The union is the thing, all those X's that are in A or are in B. The power set is the set of all subsets of A. That's a thing that, you know, like if, you know, you might remember from uh, discrete math, that thing is of size um, two to the size of A. It's very big. There's a lot of subsets, it grows exponentially. Ordered pairs are written down X comma Y. Now, and I just did it this way. I said, okay, there's a first function that projects out X and there's a, a projection function sometimes called SNED. Sometimes in math, this is called, first is called pi one for project, projection one, and SNED is pi two, and that would give you back Y, the second element. But you also want this property told. You wanna to be able to reconstruct the original pair XY by taking the first of XY and pairing that with the SNED of XY. It turned out it was kind of tricky when they were developing set theory to figure out, whoops, how to model. Um, I didn't want to do that. Now I won't go away, XPDF. It turns out you can model, you can model the pair. They often write them in kind of angle brackets. As a set, you can write this as the set containing X and then the set containing X and Y. Now that's weird because then like X comma X has the representation which is the same as should be a comma, but that's the same as just plain old, the set containing X. But with this, you can define these functions. You can define first and SNED. And I think, unfortunately, maybe with that representation, I forget, von Neumann came up with one and I forget who did the other. With that one, this may not be true. Anyway, um, the Cartesian product is just, you know, the set of pairs where the first element comes from A and the second element comes from B. And there's a typo there. There's an extra squiggly bracket. And there should be an X here. This is the generalized product. You can just take a whole bunch of sets and make, 
Cartesian product, Cartesian product, Cartesian product. I mean, the, the, and then you get back the tuples where the first element come, that should be subscript, comes from A1 and the kth element comes from A sub K. Questions? In, in, in a pretty, uh, I'm actually, I'm lying to you, but all, everybody lies uh, about this a little bit, unless you're really a set theorist. This first thing, that comprehension actually was, um, Bertrand Russell, found, used that construction to make a paradox. He said, you can define the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. And it turns out that when you define that set, it's both the case that the set of all sets that do not contain themselves are in that set of sets that doesn't contain themselves, and they're not in. And you can't have P and not P, that's a contradiction. So he was able to derive a contradiction using this construction here. So instead you have to actually do it in a typed way. You have to say, um, you really, you, you can't really just say, you know, oh, uh, X such that X, you know, some property is true of X. You have to really say X is in, and now you have to give some set. You have to describe, you have to be able to construct the set S that X is in, and then that P of X is true. And sometimes that's, really annoying and complicated to describe this set S. So we just ignore that complication and assume that we're not describing some set like Russell's paradox. But this caused a huge, huge uproar in the world of mathematics. I mean, basically when it came out, um, Cantor, had invented set theory and all mathematicians essentially started using set theory as a precise language for them to define things and they all of a sudden had this really rich language to describe the kinds of structures they were considering and when Russell's paradox came out, Hilbert, who was like the, you know, the most famous mathematician in the world at the time, basically said, ah, this is a crisis in mathemat mathematics. We all need to stop working. We don't know if we're using sets that don't actually exist or are these um, paradoxical objects. We don't know. And so what they wanted to do was rebuild set theory on and, and, and proofs on the solid foundation. Now, when you do it the way that I said over here, this is what came out in something called zermelo frankel set theory by two guys who took Cantor's set theory and made it precise. And so that's zermelo frankel set theory. Okay, so what about subsets and equality? Um, a is a subset of B. If for every element of A, that implies that same element is in B. So everything that's in A, if X is in A, then X is in B. Um, the other thing is a proper subset is one where a is a subset of B, but B is not a subset of A. In other words, B contains more things than A. There's some element of B that is not in A. A relation, maybe I better get going a little, 235? 
that's a binary relation if it's a subset of A cross B. And in if X, the pair X, Y is in R, we will write X, R, Y to simplify things. Now, R is an R area, a K area relation if it's a Cartesian product of K sets. And if R is a subset of A cross A, the set, the, the, pro, the relation R is reflexive. So I should have maybe said here, R is reflexive if and only if. For every X in A, so you pick an every, any element you pick out of A, X is in the relation to itself. And it's symmetric if no matter which two elements you choose out of A, if X is in the relation to Y, it flips around and goes the other way. Y is also in the relation to X. And it's transitive as if X, Y, Z, if X through R get, goes to Y and Y through R can go to Z, then X can go through R directly to Z. An equivalence, R is an equivalence if it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. I'm terrible at memorizing things, but at some point when I was trying to learn this stuff, for some reason, R, S, T, is an equivalence relation. And I, you know, even today, if I was writing at the board, I'd go like, okay, I need to write down an equivalence relation. What is it? I'd say first to myself, RST, oh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. I don't know. It worked for me. Maybe it can work for you. I don't know why it worked for me. I mean, I could, RST though. So when we're talking about functions, so a function, oh, this should be subset, not with the equals here. If F is a subset of A cross B, then we know F's a relation. So F is a relation. But instead of writing X, F, Y, we normally write F of X is equal to Y. And then we can write down in a kind of nice readable way. This is the most important property of a function. And here's where I really wish I had the ability to, to draw a diagram for you. Pick a point in A and pick any two points in B randomly. If F maps X to Y and F max maps um, X to Z, then it must be the case that Y and Z are the same point. That's what it means to be a function as opposed to a relation. If you've taken 4200, you could think of a deterministic finite state machine. From each uh, state, the transition system can only go to one other state. Now, in a non-deterministic machine, the transition relation might say, oh, you could go to this state or you could go to that state. And that's what's not, a, and that's a relation, it's not a function. The transition relation in a finite state machine is a function. The transition relation in a non-deterministic finite state machine is a um, relation. So you've got functions and relations. A function's total if f goes somewhere on every x from a. There's For every x in a, when you apply f to x, you get back something in b. Now, not all functions are total. In fact, if you think of a program as being a function, if the program loops forever on some inputs, then let's say the program is from integers to bool and it loops, it says true if the integer is even and it loops forever if the integer is odd. Well, it's not a very good program, but it's not, it doesn't have this total function because every time you give an odd number in, you don't get back an answer. So 
there's an important point here I just want to make, even though the time is almost up, between this and this, because it's really hard to see in the book, and you might not pick up on the difference. So if f is a function from a to b, we say f has type a arrow b with this arrow having the double times. And um, so we can define the type or uh, the space of functions from a to b to be the set of all functions that map a to b. So, oh, there's an arrow supposed to go in here. Now, the pr problem is, is that if it's a fun, if if you have a relation that's functional but isn't total, that still makes sense to talk about in terms of computer programs. So that's a different class. Those are the class of partial functions. And you write it, and you notice the arrow doesn't have anything stuck sticking out from the bottom. And so you can see that this collection of things is more constrained than this collection of things. Like just even consider functions from bool to bool where on the input true, it doesn't return anything. So it's only defined on false, that's here. But also the function that's defined on, you know, all those functions, all those functional relations from bool that have pairs of bool in them are defined here. Only the ones that don't map the same point to different places are in here. And this is willy-nilly. Any pair of elements from A can be in there. It doesn't have to be functional. Okay, sorry I went over.